to all physics enthusiasts and fans of physical experiments. This is Andrei Shchetnikov. And in this video, we will start a discussion about propeller type wind turbines. I think many of you have seen these giant installations and perhaps like me, have wondered why such a wind turbine has only three blades and such narrow ones at that. It seems that if there are more blades and if they are made wider, more air will flow over them and therefore the power of the generating unit will be greater. Well, of course, the same question can be asked about other designs with blades, for example, about the rotor of the helicopter. Why do helicopters have two, three, or at most five blades? Why not make many of them? After all, then the size of the rotor could probably be smaller while maintaining the same lift. And we will start with an experiment for which three descending devices of equal mass have been prepared. First of all, this is a parachute of a conical shape and a sufficiently large area. And these are two helicopters, the blade span of which is equal to the diameter of the parachute, but of course the area of the blades is much smaller than the area of the parachute. And this helicopter will rotate during the descent, while this one has its blades cut and reattached in such a way that it descends without rotating, simply parachuting. And we will launch them from a height of 2.5 meters. Falling from this height, they will reach a constant speed. And we will see how long it takes them to cover the last meter of the distance. Who will come forward and who will fall behind, considering their different areas, the same mass, and the fact that this helicopter will be rotating? And now we see that the parachute and the rotating helicopter descend at the same speed. Meanwhile, the helicopter with non-rotating blades moves ahead. His speed is much greater. The graphs show that the speeds during the test were indeed constant. The parachute and the rotating helicopter descended at a speed of 1.25 meters per second, while the non-rotating helicopter, which is better described as a parachute with a reduced area, descended at a speed of 3.05 meters per second. I will begin the analysis of this experience with the movement of the parachute. When it descends at a constant speed, the force of gravity is balanced by the force of air resistance. M equals the force of resistance. The force of resistance in aerodynamics is expressed as the drag coefficient multiplied by half the square of the velocity and multiplied by the area of the parachute. And if we substitute all our data, we will find that in our experiment, the drag coefficient for this parachute was approximately 1 with good accuracy. And now we will make some comparisons. Well, to start, let's compare the round parachute and this tapered parachute, which descended without rotation. His speed was, as we saw, 2.5 times greater. 2.5 squared, because in the formula speed is squared, is approximately 6, but his area is exactly 6 times smaller. Here it is 300 square centimeters, and here it is 50 square centimeters. Well, of course, a comparison of the parachute with a rotating rotor will be much more interesting. They moved at the same speed, and if you look at this formula, it can be interpreted that the effective area for the rotating rotor was essentially the same as that for the parachute, basically in essence. But it seemingly seemed that the entire circle created by its blades entirely hindered the movement of the air, yet the air resistance in both cases turned out to be exactly the same. And since the helicopter with two blades descended at the same speed as the solid round parachute, it seems that further increasing the number of blades will not lead to a slowdown in descent because there is no more room to overlap. The airflow, however, this still needs to be verified. And so, in order to successfully and effectively we made helicopters with two, three, four, and five blades. And now we will load them with various different weights and then release them and carefully observe what the drag coefficient is for each of these designs at various different descent speeds. And we see that the drag coefficient for all helicopters, just like for a solid parachute, indeed actually turned out to be practically the same. 
All experimental points lie within the approximate range of approximately 0.8 to 1. And their variation is more related to the various errors, such as in the manufacturing and testing of our aircraft. And here we must ask the main question. How is it that the effective area of all these rotating rotors turns out to be equal to the area of a solid parachute? Isn't the air passing by the blades? But it's clear that it does pass by them since they are rotating. It must be rushing against them. And to answer this question, we must discuss what happens behind the blades and what occurs in front of them. And I will start with what happens behind the blades of the spinning rotor. So when we look at our descending helicopter, it is convenient to view everything from a reference frame that moves downward at a constant speed along with the helicopter. Then, below, a laminar flow of air approaches these blades. But above, behind the blades, this flow is no longer laminar, but turbulent. And first of all, we will see that very powerful vortex flows are indeed shed from the tips of the blades. The energy of the translational motion of the air is transferred into these vortex flows. And overall, behind the blades, the movement of air is no longer laminar. It is turbulent. There are also vortices here, which means that part of the energy from the incoming flow is converted into vortex flows. And therefore, behind the blades, the flow moves at a significantly lower speed. Now take a look. Since the air behind the rotor comes to a stop and slows down overall, the picture I have drawn here, in which the air flows to the blades, and only then becomes aware of this disturbed state, is incorrect. After all, if the flow were like that, it would mean that a large amount of air is flowing through this pipe. Let's draw it like this. At high speed, but here through a tube of the same cross-section directly behind the rotor, the air flows much slower. And thus this picture definitely needs to be redrawn. The correct picture looks like this. Before the rotor, there is already an area of increased pressure, and the air hitting the rotor begins to spread out as if in advance, colliding with this area. In this sense, the spinning rotor behaves similarly to the descending parachute in our experiments. Yet, why does a wind turbine have exactly three blades? We return to this question, first looking at our helicopters, remembering that all of them, regardless of the number of blades, descended at approximately the same speed under a given weight load. For them, this was not important, and it was possible to manage with two blades, although such a helicopter rotated faster. Now we recall the large helicopters. I have already mentioned somewhere about two, three, or five blades. And surely one of the viewers has already said, what about helicopters with eight blades? So, is there some sense in increasing the number? Well, it should be noted that these helicopters are the heaviest, like the MI-26. The increase in the number of blades here is related not to aerodynamics, but to strength in order to reduce the weight load on a single blade. As for the wind turbine, we have seen that it works perfectly with three blades. And it is unclear why one would increase the number of blades if three blades are sufficient for converting the energy of the airflow into electrical energy. And rather, one should ask the question, why do wind turbines have three blades instead of two? Please share your thoughts on this in the comments of this video on YouTube, and Happy New Year, please.